Okay. Let's join together in prayer. God, we give thanks to you for the cool breeze that's working its way in. Uh, it's been a, been a hot summer, and uh, uh, the relief of the, the cool sure feels nice. We ask that uh, you'd be with us tonight as we're gathered here. Uh, we come to study your word. We want to know what it is that you had to say to the church in Rome so that uh, we can understand what it is you want to say to us today. We pray that as we are gathered here today that you would uh, bless the, uh, the hearing of the word so that we can know it most deeply and fully in our lives and draw closer to your son Jesus. It's in his, in his holy name we pray. Amen. All right. So we started on the, the book of, of Romans, the letter of Romans. Um, remember, this is, uh, this is the core of, of Paul's theology. This uh, will tell us exactly everything uh, that, that really sets at the, the, the heart of uh, the Apostle Paul and his understanding of, of who Jesus is and his relationship with him as he uh, writes to the church in Rome. And so, you know, we remember that it's a, a letter. I mean, some, a lot of these things we're going to just kind of re reacquaint ourselves with as we, we come in. It's, it's a letter written to the, the church. And, um, and we talked about how in uh, the chapter one, he has his greeting, the salutation, and how it's kind of long. And it's long because he doesn't really know the people. He hasn't been there yet. They don't have a relationship. So he's introducing himself. He's laying out his credentials, if you will, uh, in that first uh, paragraph. And then he has a prayer of thanksgiving. What translation do you use? I use the uh, New Revised Standard. And, and someone asked me about that before, so I put before me also the a New International. This is what we have in our uh, sanctuary. And so I'll have it here. And if at some point you want to ask a question about either from the translation you're using, where it's different, or if you feel like it, they're really saying different things, let me know. We'll talk that out, you know, figure out what, where the, the difference is. Um, I, I like... And this is maybe a good reason or a step back. I like to use the New Revised Standard. Um, it's the, the translation that the uh, uh, American Bible Society uh, does. And um, they do several of them, but this is kind of their primary translation. I, this was done back in the 1990s. So uh, it, it used to be a new translation. It's not a new translation anymore. Uh, but there was the Revised Standard version that was done in the 1950s. The new, Re the new Revised Standard was done in the 1990s. Uh, the New International, or the International version, um, was done in the 1970s. And it was done as kind of a response to the Revised Standard from the 1950s. It was uh, from more evangelical churches that in some ways wanted... Uh, a more evangelical reading, and so the uh, revi the international version um, came out in in that time period. Um, the interesting thing is, if you look at all translations, the Revised Standard and the New International are the closest the like of any of the translations. And then when the New Revised Standard came out in the 1990s, there was a new version of the international version that came out again, very very similar. Um, the, the places where they differ are really pretty small, um, but they're, they're both are excellent translations by great scholars. Um, one of the things that in my work, uh, when I you know, went back to work at uh, uh, Candler School of Theology, is that a number of the uh, translators were on our staff at, the, at, at Emory. And these are, these are great people. They're great people of faith, and they... Uh, are very diligent about the work that they do, and um, and, and and so to, to just know some of their personal integrity about it uh, is, I, I, it's a good thing. And, and members of both committees of the of the, those groups. So um, then we we move to kind of in verses sixteen and seventeen to to Paul's summary of what this letter is about in uh, chapter one. And, and then after his summary, he moves into the, the heart of his argument, uh, the, the body of the letter. And the, the body of the letter 
uh, starts in, in verse 18, and what goes through the rest of the first chapter is the description of humanity as humanity's sinfulness, of humanity's uh, fallenness from grace, and that, uh, and that everyone has fallen short. Um, from a Jewish perspective, you'd know that um, the, the general assumption would be that uh, the, that the Gentile world, the pagans who are not Jewish, uh, were outside of the law. So they were outside of God's righteousness in, in, from their perspective. And, and so then what Paul argues is that, um, that any of us, not only is it that the rest of the world is, is fallen, and, um, but that, that even those who are of Jewish practice don't practice the law completely. And so in that... Uh, that the law has been violated, and he uh, then has that list of um, beginning, I guess, in verse 30. Well, it begins in verse 29 of chapter 1. Of every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness, they are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, uh, inventors of evil, rebellious toward parents, Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Uh, and they know the decrees of God. And um, so what he's wanting to do, he's not trying to make an exhaustive list of every, every way that we sin. He's just trying to make one where we at least see ourselves in it. That's the, the point. That we see, well, gosh, I've been a gossiper before. Um, I've certainly been foolish. There are times I've been faithless. I've been heartless, heartless. I, I try, I don't know that I've been ruthless, but, uh, uh, you know, there, there, there are lots of ways that I've fallen short. And by looking at that list, I can see the ways that I've fallen short. And so the, the intent is to let everyone know that we're in need of grace. I mean, that's the point. <laughs> None of us can stand on our own righteousness because we've all fallen short. Uh, I was talking with someone today. And I hope I'm right and she was wrong. But she said, Scott, I, you know, I, uh, every day almost, I think about something that I've done in the past where I hurt somebody or something that I did. And it just comes back to me. And, I'm, and it, it's like I'm fully back into that moment. And I said, I think all of us have that experience. You know, I can, you know, I can think of things I've done wrong in my life. That come, that come present to me, and it's like I feel the weight of that again. And um, I, although I, we, you know, our, our hope is we're set free, and we want to be set free, but, but sometimes our, 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 the tapes we have in our mind, they're so present to us that they will come back to us and remind us of our fallenness. And, um, and, and I said, I think most of us experience that. She said, I don't think so. I think most people don't. I think most people don't think that... Uh, about things they've done that were wrong in the past and that those don't come back to them. And, uh, and maybe there's some who don't, I don't know. Um, but I, I, if we're here, I think we probably fall pretty close into the category of those who, who have remorse over ways that we have sinned and, and fallen short. And um, God doesn't want us to live there. That's, you know, there's grace. We all, the point he makes in this first chapter is we've all fallen short. None of us um, uh, are perfect, and none of us have not misstepped in our walk. And so then he moves into the second chapter, and we, we looked at this first section, and we'll, uh, we'll go into it uh, further today, and the second chapter is what we're really going to spend our, our time on. So after describing that all of us have fallen short, that none of us can stand in our own righteousness. He says in, in, in verse 1 of chapter 2, and here's where you want to listen if your translation is different and you feel like it's substantively different. Let's stop and talk about it. You know, there might be different words, but, um, you know, someone will use the, the $10 word, you know, for what I might use the $1 word. And, and so we might have some of those kind of differences, but they mean the same thing. Um, so therefore, you have no excuse, 
whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, are doing the same things. You say, we know that God's judgment, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with the truth. Do you imagine, whoever you are, that when you judge those who do such things, you do them yourself, and you, uh, and you, that you will escape the judgment of God? Uh, so if you, you know, that in knowing that you've fallen short, you've broken the law, uh, and then if you judge someone else, um, you just bring God's judgment upon yourself because uh, you've broken those laws. Um, or you, do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So um, the, here he begins to, to make an argument. The, the first part of it is, so all of us stand in need of God's grace, so none of us get to judge. None of us get to judge anyone else. Um, and But then if we have fallen short and we think that God's law applies to other people, but maybe not so much to us, are we just relying upon God's forbearance without uh, uh, really practicing a faith? Uh, and as such, would we despise God's riches of kindness and forbearance and patience? But his kindness <laughs> is meant to lead you to repentance. So this is the key. All of us fallen short, and God grants us grace. And God's kindness, forbearance in our lives is meant for reconciliation, for us to repent of the sin that we've committed in our lives so that our life can be set right again. Um, without repentance, um, grace is pretty cheap. Um, when we realize that we've fallen short, but we don't want to change, we don't want to do something different, um, but we want God to grant us grace, that's, that's pretty cheap grace, you know? We want off the hook and not have to do much about it. But, um, but what, what God intends for us is that um, when we come to the realization of our sinfulness, our brokenness, that we, um, we make an effort to change and to, to become someone new. And, and so his uh, kindness is granted to us for, for that purpose. Um, in verse 5, but by your hand... And uh, imp but by your hard and impotent hearts, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. For he will repay according to each one uh, one's deeds to those who, are, uh, who by patiently doing good seek for glory and honor and uh, immortality he will give eternal life. While for those who, see, who are self-seeking and who obey not the truth but wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. So here he, he indicates that um, when, when we seek the right, uh, there, will, there will be uh, eternal life as, as the reward. Um, he's, he's really kind of drawing... Uh, this for us to understand that, um, well, as, as we move forward, we'll, we'll see that, um, that, that this is kind of a, a thing that applies both for those inside the Jewish faith and those outside of it. And he's, he's writing primarily talking to, to Jewish Christians in, in the church at this time. And um, it will become much more apparent as we, as we move forward. But that... Um, we can't, the, 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 the early Jewish church, Christian church, uh, can't impose all of the Jewish law onto all of the new Christians who uh, are coming in, who are Gentile, and they don't have any experience of, of what the Jewish law is about. Uh, what he's in, in essence saying is that there are some 
outside of the faith um, who are practicing uh, do, or patiently doing good and seeking glory and honor uh, and immortality. Uh, they might be outside of the faith doing such things. Um, it doesn't mean they're fall, not fallen as well. But, um, and, and we all know folks who would fall into that category. Someone who's not a Christian, but a good person who does what's right. And, and that they, they fall close to what Christ is seeking. Um, it's not the fullness of it, but they, they fall close. And that judgment will come again to those uh, who are self-seeking and don't obey the truth, but wickedness. So in uh, verse 9, there will be anguish and distress for everyone who does evil, the Jew first and also to the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also to the Greek, for God shows no partiality. Um, the, or favor, the way a lot of translations would say. Mine says Gentile instead of Greek. Yeah. Um, they're basically, you know, it, when it says Greek or translated Greek, it means anyone who is of the Greco world, which is I mean, outside of the, the, Gentile, the Jewish world. They're, they're basically synonymous in how they're... Oh, like the, the country of Greece. Yeah, no, it doesn't, it doesn't mean, okay, the Italians are exempt... <laughs> Um, the Spaniards, no one knows what in the world they're going to do. Uh, you know, and we live in such an international world. But um, the, in, in that day, uh, whenever it would say Greek, what it meant when you were talking about it from a, Je a Jewish perspective, it meant the whole Gentile, non-Jewish world is, is what that referred to. Um, and whenever it would talk about pagan, um, it meant everyone outside of those who were Jewish. Um, it didn't mean particular pagan practices or anything. It, it meant anyone who fell outside of the, the Jewish community. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Great question. Well, Greek was the common business language. It was. Yeah, and, and it, it was changing in that time. And, and we get to a big division later between the, the Greek-speaking and the Latin-speaking worlds. Uh, but, but you're right. I mean, this, it's been the, the primary language for commerce and uh, community. Now, I want to, before we jump into this next section, because that's kind of, this has partly been our, our review. Um, when, when we look at the book of Romans, we've been so influenced by Martin Luther about works and uh, versus faith. So I think as we move forward from here, I'm gonna, we, we're gonna have to do a little deconstruction. And the, the first is to talk about um, whenever Paul talks about works, we need to hear works of the law. And, and that's what he, he's going to be describing. That whenever we, uh, when, when he says, you know, well, some will show their works and others their faith, he really is primarily talking about <laughs> works of the law. That um, a person could say, well, I practice the law. I, uh, I'm kosher. I, I follow the, the practice of Israel's customs. And um, in a way that for some was like cla claiming a badge um, to say, uh, I am righteous because I have the works of the law that I fulfill. And, um, and this is going to be the real debate because the, um, so much of the heart of the issue in this time is how Jewish does a Christian have to be? Um, do you, do you have to be a Jew completely by works of the law in order to be a Christian? And who can be included, who's not included? And, and, and this is the, the heart of the struggle for the first century church. Jesus and all the disciples 
were Jewish. The first people that com they converted into the faith were Jewish. But before long, Gentiles began to be converted as well. They were first what we would, um, uh, would talk about as God-fearers. And these were people who were, Jew, uh, were Gentile, Greek, who um, began to see something in Judaism that they liked and wanted to follow. And so these people would be standing around the edges of the Jewish community. And many of them, as the Christian faith came about, um, they would come to faith. But then ones who had, so they had some background in the Jewish tradition, but others um, had none at all. And they began to come to faith. And uh, uh, there's a, a really unusual story in the book of uh, Acts about an Ethiopian eunuch. Um, and and, and it, the story is, you know, this Ethiopian eunuch, uh, he's, he is wealthy. He uh, handles the money for the queen. And... Um, it says that he's riding in his chariot and he's reading his Bible. Now, you can't imagine how wealthy a person would have to be in that day to have a Bible. I mean, people didn't have Bibles. Um, literacy rate was like 10% at the highest. Uh, people just didn't own Bibles. And uh, he's reading his Bible and he says, it says here this, you know. And, and so there's this whole encounter about how he comes to faith. Um, he was probably the most extreme example of somebody coming to faith outside. I mean, one, he's Ethiopian. Um, whenever it says in the Bible he, someone was from Ethiopia, it was like saying they were from Timbuktu. Um, you know, I, I don't know where Timbuktu is. I do now, but I didn't used to. You know, but, but it, what, I, what it meant, you know, someone in our culture, what it meant to say he was from Timbuktu. I don't care if you go to Timbuktu. It just meant as far away and a little further, you know. And, um, and so he, and he's a eunuch. Um, eunuchs weren't allowed into the temple. And he was on his way to Jerusalem to go to the temple. He wasn't going to be allowed. He was going to be standing on the edge looking in. And, uh, and yet uh, God somehow chooses to reach out and to bring him to faith. He would have been one of those God-fearers we, we were talking about. But someone who was really on the edge of that, that community. Um, let's talk a little bit about in the Bible... Uh, where the law comes from. When, when does the, in the story of God's salvation, where does the, the law become an important thing? Who, who does God deliver the law to? Moses. Moses. All right. So uh, when does God deliver the, the law to Moses? Is it before the Exodus or after the Exodus? After. Okay. All right. So we have the Exodus and then the law. Um, the Exodus event is a salvation event. And then the law comes as the uh, So God saves the people, and then God gives them the law, and the law is the way to keep a good relationship with God and each other. Um, so the law comes as, as a result of salvation. Now, what Paul is going to talk to us about, and we read through Martin Luther's eyes, is, is kind of a reverse of this, that, that what Paul experiences by the law is a weight and a, a, a condemnation, that, that through the law, we, we, we know that we are sinful. Um, he knows all the ways that he's broken the law. He's, he's worse than any of us, put to, all of us put together in terms of remembering. Now, he'll say, I was righteous as a Pharisee among Pharisees, but 
he, he has, is such a weight upon him for all the ways that he's ever fallen short in the law that it's a burden to him. And what he experiences in Jesus is freedom. So he experiences the other way around. Law is, is, is God's condemnation. And then he experiences salvation through Jesus that sets him free. And, um, and it's kind of the opposite of how the people of Israel have experienced law. That God gave them salvation. He brought them out of the land of Israel. And then he gave it to them the law as a way to keep in a right relationship with God. So I know I'm talking a lot outside of the text. But as we get into it, I think this framework will help us understand really what Paul is, is wrestling with as he goes. The law never offers salvation. No. The law doesn't offer salvation. That's right. Um, the, the best hope we have is that we can look at it and say, you know, I've been pretty good and uh, I've done my best and, and, and except for driving 55 in a 50, I've, you know, followed the law. I, that's where it get me every time. I, you know, I drive too fast, I, I know. Uh, and, and that's an easy one to confess, right? Um, so then he moves into this part and and what he wants to say to us is that salvation comes to us outside of the law. That it doesn't come to us through the law. Now we'll look at, at verse 12. All who have sinned apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So you understand what he's saying? All, all who have sinned apart from the law will be will also perish apart from the law. That you know it's one one can sin outside of the law, never knowing what the law tells us because we know God's kind of moral compass in our hearts. Um, and the one, um, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged under the law. So again, he wants to say there's no difference between us we find ourselves in the same spot, whether we are Jewish or we're, we're Christian. And, and in a community where some Jewish Christians feel like they are superior and they've got it all together and they can look down upon Gentile Christians, he's got to get them into this box where they're sitting side by side and understand we've got the same situation going on in our lives. Um, just because you practice the law your whole life doesn't mean you're at any advantage over a person who's just come to this faith. We're, we sit in the same box. We're, we're both condemned. Neither one of us deserve God's love or mercy. Um, so we're judged either way. It is not the hearers of the law who are righteous in God's sight, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Now, again, we're not talking about um, good works that one practices out of their faith, but this is uh, about um, doers of the law, the works of the law won't give us righteousness. Um, the, he, he's talking about a really a, in a different matter here. So when Gentiles who do not possess the law, in verse 14, do instinctively what the law requires, these, though not having the law, are a law unto themselves. So they instinctively know what God's intending for us. Um, I think that's, that's where God gives us a moral conscience. Uh, we have a sense about right or wrong. Um, I, Immanuel Kant 
was a German philosopher. And, um, you know, in, in philosophy from the very beginning, one of the things that they all wanted to do was be able to prove the existence of God. And so they kept working on how they could prove God's existence. And, um, you know, different people argued, you know, when you get to the modern era, it becomes more difficult because you can't, you know, the first principles of God as the first mover, the first creator that Aristotle and Aquinas uh, talked about. Um, you know, you can't prove that God was there to start it all. I mean, you really, you, no, one, no one was there. How can we prove God's the creator? Um, it's something we take on faith. Well, in, in every, every kind of movement, then someone would try to prove a new rationale for the existence of God. So Immanuel Kant said, well, um, what we can prove is that there's morality. And because there's a moral universe, um, there must be a God who's moral who created it. Um, and so that was kind of this moral duty was his grounding for how he argued for the existence of God. Um, I, I think ultimately it's all about faith anyway. Um, you know, we, we want to give certainty. Um, there's, there's no proof for this. I mean, there, there's no proof for our faith. Faith is a totally different act. It's an act that we, uh, we do from a different place. I can, you know, we can prove to you two plus two is four. You know, we can put two apples here and two apples here, and now it equals four. Believing in God, believing that Jesus was raised from the dead, believing that our sins are forgiven to us um, because of the work of Jesus, there's no mathematical formula for that. It, it's, it's a heart matter. I mean, it happens from our heart. We have faith that these things are true. And um, I, I wish we could tell you there's science for it. It's, it's not that. Um, in, in fact, it's something far bigger than science. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, a, it's a trust. And, and so, you know, that's, that's where we're kind of working toward, um, that there, you know, Immanuel Kant wanted to argue that, that there was a, a moral law that uh, moves us. And, um, and, what, and what Paul is arguing is that, uh, that even when they instinctively do what's uh, right means that they have an understanding of the law itself. And they show that uh, what the law requires is written on their hearts to which their own conscience also bears witness and their, conf their uh, conflicting thoughts will accuse or uh, perhaps excuse them on the day when according to my gospel, God through Jesus Christ will judge the secret thoughts of all. So in a way, I mean, Paul is saying here that by, uh, by knowing that sense of God's uh, moral push in the world, that they're by, they'll know what's right or what's wrong, and then their behavior and how they live that will either uh, accuse them of, of how they've fallen short or, or maybe excuse them um, if a person could be entirely righteous <coughs> outside of uh, that. Um, and that's, he's not arguing that point, but, that, um, but, but there's something within us that, that gives the, uh, the nature of, of, of God's morality and how we are to live. And um, in verse 17, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast on your relationship to God, again, we're back here to this works of the law, to, that, that you say that that's what gives you righteousness. If you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in your relationship to God, because of the law, that's my parentheses added in there, you know his will and determine what is best because you are instructed in the law. And if you are sure that you are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector to the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, then uh, you then that teach others 
Will you not teach yourselves? So here he's, he's saying, um, you know, you, you, you want to claim the special relationship with God, and yet you've fallen short too. And so you need to, to be teaching yourself as well. Um, basically, the point is none of us get to claim any credit. None of us get to say, well, I made a 90 on the test. I deserve an A. Um, the, the, there, there's no privileged relationship with God through the law. It, we just don't get that um, because we've fallen short. And then he goes through the examples of the ways that can be fallen short. Is that why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, unless your, your law exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, not in the right place. That's it. No, that's it. It's what he said exactly. And if you, you know, uh, had anger toward your brother, it's like having committed murder. Um, that God's righteousness is higher than even the law. And, um, and that's the only way that we're, you know, we could ever stand justified in that. And he's basically said to us, none of us, and we know from our own hearts, even if we're Christian or Jew, Jewish or non-Jewish, we know in our own hearts that none of us have lived that kind of life. Yeah, I mean, it's exa it exactly. Uh, so then he, he says to, him, to them, while you preach against stealing, do you steal? Uh, you that forbid adultery, do you commit adultery? You that abhorred, abhorred idols, uh, do you rob temples? You that boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So where this is, this is the argument you hear people outside the church make. Oh, well, they're just a bunch of hypocrites, <coughs> you know. Uh, you know, that's, that's what he's saying. Because you all claim to have this righteousness with God, and then you cheat somebody in business, or... You, you, you don't do things right. Um, whenever, whenever you break the law, um, you allow other people to say, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. They're no different than the rest of us. They still sin the same way that all of us sin. Um, now, that, I mean, that's, that's basically Paul's argument there. Uh, because uh, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So it's when you claim that kind of righteousness and then you can't live up to it that people look on. In this sense, he's talking about the Jewish faith and, um, and bring about a word, you know, uh, you can't trust them either. So they're no different than the rest of us. It, you know, it's, it's pretty heavy stuff here. You know, it's not, this is, this is not really the fun stuff of Book of Romans. There's fun stuff that we get to, but this is heavy stuff that, uh, of knowing about uh, the struggle that's going on in this church. Um, not just the Roman church, but in all of Christianity, what's happening is that there are, in the, the context of the church, those that are Jewish and those that are Gentile and, and they're fussing about the stuff in between. And so he's trying to get at it. You know, again, y'all are all in the same boat. So quit fighting with each other about it. And then let's move on to the more important aspects of, of the faith. So he's trying to get them all on the same playing field. Um, and, you know, the, the technical word for this form uh, that he's arguing here is called a diatribe. Um, in, in our context today, we think of a diatribe in, oh, I don't know, pretty negative language. But in, in terms of Greek rhetoric, a diatribe was just another form of argument. It wasn't um, mean the way we think of a diatribe these days. So uh, in verse 25, he, he moves on to the next section. And, and this will, again, put us right back to what is the place of the law. It says, so circumcision, indeed, 
is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. I, I, you know, this has puzzled theologians for years. What, what's Paul really talking about? But if you don't understand this Jewish-Gentile debate and struggle that's going on, you'll, you'll totally miss what he's talking about. Because this is not about um, a practice uh, done on men and boys. Uh, this is about something about whether one gets to claim a privileged relationship with God. So if you, uh, your circumcision indeed is valuable if you obey the law. But we've already said nobody obeys the law completely. So then it becomes, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So it means that you're outside of the law. You're not following the practice of the law. Uh, so if those who are circumcised keep the requirements of the law, um, will not their uncircumcision uh, be required, be regarded as circumcision? So, okay, so if those who are uncircumcised keep the requirements of the law, will not their uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? So if a, if a Gentile practice every bit of the law, then they could claim a righteous, right relationship with, uh, with God. Um, and then in verse 27, then those who are physically uncircumcised but keep the law condemn you that have written code and circumcision but break the law. For a person who is not a Jew, who is one outwardly, nor is, uh, nor is true circumcision something external and physical. Rather, a person who is Jew, a Jew, who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart. It is spiritual and not literal. Such a person receives praise, not from others, but from God. Okay, I know this is, we're, I'm gonna try to tie it all up for us here. Um, who was the person who was first circumcised in the, the Bible? Abraham. Abraham. Abraham was. And so we're gonna get to this argument about Abraham. So Abraham uh, was asked to do something that uh, was quite difficult, right? And, uh, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, that he was faithful to God. And he did that before he was ever circumcised. That circumcision happened afterwards as a response to this relationship with God. It was, it was basically a way to distinguish himself as different from others. And so... It was a response to what had already happened. God had already, if you will, granted him grace um, before he was ever circumcised. So um, here, what it's, it's telling us is that, um, that circumcision or the practice of the law, which is, became the requirement of the law, and here it's, it basically is one and the same that to be circumcised meant one was a practicer of the law and that one claimed a privileged relationship. Well, I'm one of Father Abraham's. I'm circumcised, I'm a Pharisee among Pharisees. I get to claim this privileged relationship because of the law and because our family practices the law. And we've gone to Methodist Church ever since we were born. And, uh, you know, I never missed a Sunday. And I got gold stars from going to Sunday school. And, and so I've got this privileged relationship with God because of all that. And look at how good I am. And I sing in the choir. And I teach Bible study and all those kinds of things. And, um, and so God loves me. He may not love you, but he loves me. And, um, you know, and, okay, I'm, I'm trying to draw this full circle. And because... My great-grandma, Abraham, you know, grandfather Abraham, was the one who uh, brought us into here. So now we have this privileged relationship. And Paul's saying, it's none of that. It's none of that at all. Circumcision, he says, 
when we get to it, is, is neither real. Um, it's, it's not an, uh, something that, uh, he said, it's about a matter of the heart. Uh, it's a spiritual, not a literal thing. And so Paul's response, or Paul, Abraham's response in circumcision um, comes after he's been justified. And, and, and he'll get very particularly to talk about Abraham and Abraham's justification under the law, that um, it comes to him before he was ever in a right relationship with God. God granted it to him, and, uh, and he accepted it. And, and so because of that, um, none of us then get to claim this privileged relationship, but somehow circumcision became a part of that. Now, let's, I, I don't want to push this too far because I've already a couple of minutes ago had my five-minute warning. But um, okay, if you are a member of the Jewish faith, and you believe that everyone who's a Christian needs to follow the Jewish law. And so you want to make everybody, all those who are Gentile, to follow the Jewish law. Um, if you want to keep some of those people out, adult men out, um, where are you going to draw the line about who gets to be in and who gets to be out? You've got to be circumcised. Um, there are a lot of men in this category who are going to say, no thanks, buddy. Um, you know, the, it, this becomes a wedge issue in the early church about uh, whether one practices the law or not. And so how, how Jewish do you have to be in order to be a Christian? Do you have to go to the synagogue every Sabbath? Do you have to uh, not just follow the Ten Commandments, but follow all the commandments? If you're a, a male... Do you have to be circumcised in order to be a part of it? Oh, you're not willing to do that? Okay, well, that's easy. You're out. This is us. And so this is where, you know, if, if you're in that perspective, that's where it's going to be at. And that, y'all can take it and go somewhere else. Um, so there's this big struggle in the early church over all these issues. And um, after all, going to Sunday school before church is a good thing. You ought to do it. But it's not a salvation issue. Um, it doesn't decide whether one is saved or not. Um, singing in the choir is a great thing. Uh, going to serve meals at the soup kitchen uh, are a great thing. A needed thing, important work. Um, all those things are good, but they're not ultimately salvation issues. One doesn't get to decide because of all these things now, um, you know, and because I've done it for 50 years, um, I have a privileged relationship with God. And that's, that's where he's arguing with them because some are claiming it. Some are claiming, well, I grew up, I, my, I'd always been Methodist, always been Baptist, always been whatever tradition. And all these people that are part of it, I've inherited a right by how I've come to that. And so I have a better relationship with Jesus than you do. Um, because I do all of these things. I have all the works of the law as my credit. Um, that's, that's what Paul's arguing here. Uh, now, we can, if, if you read back through it, I think you'll see it. When we go through it the first time, it's probably hard to see uh, because you know, you, you, it's too easy to get caught up in, in what he's, he's dealing with there. But that, that ultimately is at the heart of it. Will this be a church that's open to everybody to be able to come and, uh, and to find their way into a, a heart relationship with Jesus? Or is it going to set up barriers that will keep people away? And, um, you know, do you have to be a member of the country club? Do you have to do this and that in order to, to have a relationship with Jesus? And, and Paul's saying no. He's saying no. And... Um, and there are a lot of people saying yes. There are a lot of people saying there are other criteria that have to be met too. So um, I lay that out there, and then we'll we'll move forward with it. And I think as you know, with that foundation we've gotten to now, as we've gotten through to the end of chapter two, it'll just become more and more apparent the struggle and tension that's going on in the church, and how Paul's trying to lead them through it, so that they can get to a place where they're 
all relying upon Jesus' grace. All right? Got any questions, thoughts? So circumcision seems like a world away from us, you know? I mean, this sounds like a conversation that's so, so far away, but it, it really is about setting up as big a hurdle of keeping people out as you can possibly set, I think. Or do we tear it all down and let it just be back to the, the heart of the faith? So, um, which is hard for Paul because he's, he, you know, he's invested. I mean, he was invested in that, that whole world. It was his life. So he's got to let it all go. Um, so, but he did, and he moved to this other place. And that, so that it's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, as he later says in uh, uh, Galatians, you know, that, um, that but we're all one in the body of Christ. So. All right, thank you.